Okay, so welcome to our first uh, podcast with Hitting the Sticks. And we have our guest, Greg Blessinger from uh, Jury Outdoors here. So uh, we got some questions and everything we're going to be asking him today. And uh, I guess we should just start off with the first question. So the first question I got here is, how did you get involved with DOD, so Jury Outdoors? Uh, basically a friend of mine, Brian Thompson, um, we became friends over several years and he was a team member, a DOD team member at the time. And, um, over several years, we just talked and, um, I said, you know, I always want to get to Iowa to hunt and, and, uh, just kind of, you know, build my knowledge of, of basically whitetail hunting. And one, uh, several years went by and, uh, we had several conversations regarding it and, uh, one, I think it was Christmas Eve night, probably I'm shooting at the hip at this 15, 16 years ago. Um, Mark gave me a call and I couldn't believe, you know, uh, it took me back by surprise cause you recognize, recognize a voice because of obviously television, yeah. but I didn't expect his call. And, um, I had a house full of people at the time. And, um, he's like, well, can we talk another time? I'm like, absolutely. So I call him a few days later. And by, by the end of that call, we had set up a, uh, a meeting down in Grand River, Iowa. That's where he was living at the time. And, uh, I drove down there and, um, we met up one night about six, seven o'clock at night. And we stayed up till I believe it was like four 30 AM, uh, just shooting the breeze and talking about family and the outdoors and my philosophy and how to manage a property to business to just a whole lot of things. And, you know, he was just picking my brain of how, how I could fit within the DOD brand and their lifestyle. And, you know, would I be a, a good fit for a DOD team member? And that's kind of where it all started. I would definitely say that'd probably be one of the best Christmas presents you could have. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, he's, you know, Mark and Terry, you know, they've been doing this. Well, now it's 33 years, I believe. Wow. Um, I didn't know. Yeah. And you know, they, they, they're very particular. Um, You don't, you don't get to, you know, their status and being in business for as long as they have without doing something right. And to be around this long and be this successful, they're very particular on who they associate themselves with, not only with brands, but also people that bring on with the team. And because whoever they bring on uh, the team is going to represent DOD as well as the brands that they represent. So they're, they're very particular on, on who that's going to be. And they vent them very you know seriously. And they put us on a trial period, any, any new, team member comes on is on a trial per- period for at least a year if not two before you become a full-blown team member um, because they want to see how you handle yourself in front of television how you handle yourself in social media are you saying anything that's foolish you know are you disrespecting the brand or the brands they represent and so you know we they're very particular in that selection process and they should be um, that's their business that's how they make a living and they, they don't want to put it in, in any, you know, person's lap that could potentially, you know, uh, jeopardize their, uh, their business philosophies and opportunities. And so to be selected and, and you know, I guess um, offered into the, the inner circle um, of the DLD family is, is, you know, there's, I don't know, there's 40 or 50 of us that are on the team now um it's it's uh a very much a privilege and an honor but also it's it's very demanding too i mean it's not for everybody i mean just because you're selected doesn't mean you can hold hold the team member status you know forever because we we get evaluated every single year um they restack the deck and you know they get us back on track and that's why you see some guys come and go over time uh, you know, hunting is a not a guaranteed sport. They're very reasonable about it uh, and fair, but they do have requirements 
uh, and demands that need to be met. And if you're not going to meet them, they're going to find somebody who, who's going to. So um, the work really starts once you get selected because the demands and the requirements that we need to be successful are not easy. And they're not, um, they're not for a lazy person. You won't make it. Yes. That's, I was always kind of wondering what all went into the process of you know, getting selected to be a part of that. Because I mean, they're, they're one of the most well-known brands out. And every person who puts Jury Outdoors behind their name, like that's also representing Mark and Terry and, you know, you that's, that's their name on, on everything. So I always yeah. kind of what all went into it. But. Well, uh, you know, we, we, uh, they, they have a process that we get uh, no better way than say that we get graded by every single year yes. and we get rack and stacked and uh, you get treated uh, differently, uh, no different than a, you know, a sales organization. If you produce a lot of, you know, sales in your organization, you're going to get treated different than you will if you're at the bottom of the, of the line. And the guys who produce well and um, pull the wagon hard, uh, they get treated differently. And that's just the way the world works. Yes, that's and you know, the top 10 guys get treated different than the bottom 10 guys. And if you want to be treated like the top 10, well, you better find a way to get there. Yeah, you better put the work in. You got to put the work in. You got to produce the way they want you to produce. You got to tell the story. You got to have, you know, all kinds of different angles and, you know, have stuff in focused and good lighting and all those things. It's just, it's just not tipping over the animal in a frame. I mean, there's so much front end middle back telling the story uh for the prep work all of it that's just it's more than what the tv represents i mean put it an example you know tonight is 13 and critical mass is the direct outdoors power hour sun at nine o'clock in the outdoor channel and you know there's of a 30 minute episode there's about 13 minutes or 13 and a half minutes i might be off but i'm really close of true content in that 30 minute show so to give it in perspective, uh, Casey and I probably produce, oh my gosh, <laughs> um, if I had to guess, probably uh, three to 400 hours of video per year. Wow. And you're going to see like my episode of the 233 is going to air this Thursday at 9 p.m. Central Time on the Outdoor Channel. And you'll see roughly 13 and a half minutes. Wow. I, I did not know that's how much footage. Now I'm talking for a season, right? I'm talking for a season. So, you know, we, we have out West trips. We have a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, in our out West trips, we probably have, you know, I don't know. I'm going to guess 60 to 80 hours of footage just on that, that trip alone, maybe more, maybe a hundred hours of footage from between time lapse povs travel prep shooting the bow setting up the bow i mean there's just there's a ton there's an absolute ton of work that goes into it so when they start picking out the best clips that they see fit to tell the story you're only going to see 13 or 14 minutes of a several hundred hours that the team puts into this and that's the part that the general public uh, unfortunately don't really can appreciate behind the scenes efforts. Yes. That's, that's kind of what me and you've talked about before is there's a lot that goes into all of this to even become as, as successful as you have been deer hunting. And I mean, just hunting in general. And I mean, you've put in the work to be where you're at. There's no if, ands or buts about that. Just from our conversation, I've, I sat there that night with a notebook and just wrote down everything just because of, I mean, just how much I've learned just from talking. Yeah. Time. yeah. Well, you know, it, it, um, there, the, the whole DLD team deserves to be there. I mean, they're all, they're all killers in their own, in their own right. Um, 
they've all earned their spots. Uh, you know, um, trying to harvest animals is not a guarantee every single year. Everybody's going to have an ups and down year. That's just the way the world works. But when you look at the team as a whole, consistently, we have a really amazing group of team members that really find a way to get it done year in and year out. And I think that's the part that is amazing to me. And oh, by the way, not only are they getting it done, but they're laying it down on, on film. And when you start bringing a second guy into the woods, you have double the scent, double the sound, double the movement, which then decreases your opportunities by a factor of, I don't know, but it's a lot. Yeah. Uh, because now, you know, if, if the bow hunter has them and the camera doesn't, we can't shoot. Or if the camera has them and the archer doesn't have them, we can't shoot. So you have all these factors that go into it. And for us to lay it on film, it's really, really hard and really special when it comes together. And obviously you guys don't see the, the, all the opportunities that, that don't happen um, because of the situations I just talked about. I mean, it's just, it's, it's countless how many times those happen and yeah. it's frustrating and you got to be truly dedicated to the camera to one. Um, you, you truly got to love it to be that dedicated. Cause if you're not, you're just going to cut the air loose and who cares what the footage is, exactly. but you know, that's not what we're out there to do is we're dedicated to Drury outdoors, obviously, as well as bringing the best footage possible to the outdoor channel and to the general public. So we put a lot of effort in doing that, a lot of prep work in just the camera setups and, and batteries and SD cards and settings and making sure all the cameras are ready to go and they're white balanced and they're not out of color. And I'm telling you, it is an absolute ton of work to do it the right way. I, I definitely believe you because just the small portion that we have done, like, I mean, it's, it's been a challenge just to, you know, figure out how to be in a tree stand and film these deer i mean even just walking around you not even trying to film a shot without when you know have your when you have like six or seven deer around you i mean how to maneuver that camera without being caught in a tree you know and it's 100 you bet it's it's definitely a different art form i mean that's the best way i can put it it's it's a very yeah Thing. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. It's an art form because, you know, the way we, Casey and I have been very blessed. Uh, we've been together now for six years and Casey's a very avid bow hunter on his own right. I mean, the guy is, is very talented. And when we started hunting together, that was a huge plus because I've had uh, cameramen's, you know, before that were okay bow hunters or not so much bow hunters, but they knew how to run a camera. And, and it, you want to have a, you want to have a combination of both the guy who can run a camera, but also a guy who knows how to bow hunt because really you're bow hunting with a camera. Honestly, yeah. um, you got to know when to move, when not to move um, and those type of things. And sometimes you can't and, and you have to give up the shot or give up the angle and just give it five or six seconds to hopefully, you know, recover it, whatever. And you have to process that in the moment of truth and nobody can do that, but the individual behind the camera. So it's, it's very much a team situation and you're only as good as the guy, you know, left or right of you. And we've been very lucky enough that uh, as Casey and I have spent the hours together, you know, he knows what I'm thinking. I know what he's thinking before the movie even happens. So um, it's going to be, you know, the next several years, as long as we can do this, it's going to be just as much fun as the last six. Exactly. And it, it always is way more fun when you got somebody that, you know, shares the same passion with you and you guys are both hitting the fields or, you know, hitting the woods together and sharing the experiences. I mean, just one of me and like our group that we have, I mean, every one of us, we've known each other for a while and we all just decided we was going to start this and it's created already some of the best memories that I've ever had hunting. Oh yeah, no yeah. doubt. It's, you know, if, if you, <clears throat> I've said this before in another podcast, I said, you know, if you win a lottery by yourself, uh, it's really not that special, but if you have somebody you really care about and you win it, you have somebody to share it with. Yeah. And this is no different than when we're, we're 
hunting a particular deer, which most often we are, um, and you put your season around one particular animal, uh, a lot of preparation, a lot of thought process, you know, goes into that. And when you achieve that, it's pretty special because you're sharing with somebody, but also the failures just as, just as bottom rock bottom is when you hit it. If, if something doesn't go well, you, you both feel like crap and it's a long evening, you know, nobody really wants to, <laughs> to break the silence on the, in the truck after the, the ride home. But, you know, but when it comes together, it's as sweet as it can be. Absolutely. And I think that's the part that wakes it. That's the reason why I film is because bow hunting, when you think about it, is truly an individual sport. Yes. And when I got into filming, uh, being an ex-athlete and very competitive, um, I just love to win. I love to compete. I love to win. Yeah. Um, whether it's business, it doesn't matter. I just, you put the objective in front of me, I'm going to find a way to, to execute. And when you have a team atmosphere like that and it comes together, the victory is much sweeter with somebody than it is individual. Exactly. It's like winning a base. It's like winning a tournament in baseball. Oh, hundred percent. And that's why, you know, filming for me is why I do it. Yes. Putting it on TV is cool. Yes. It's neat. All those things. Absolutely. I'm not going to take any of that away. Yes. But it sure is a lot more fun uh, doing it with somebody that has the same amount of passion, if not more for what you're doing. Because when it comes together, you're, you're both on cloud nine. And it's hard to explain until, you, until you've been there. Yeah, once you experience it, it's an experience like no other. I mean. Well, I just, when we did it uh, this past fall, elk, elk season, we were in a, a makeshift ground blind in a cedar tree. <laughs> and we hit this elk at 55 yards. And I looked at the camera and I said, this is why we do it. And, you know, because we were both jacked up. It was a long week and a lot of miles on the boots. and finally it came together, you know, and it, it's, it's one of those things that it's so much sweeter when you have somebody to share it with than just yourself. And so one of my big things, whenever I came to like hunting very seriously was ba I played a lot of baseball. I traveled all over playing baseball. So baseball, I mean, obviously, you know, you're a big baseball fan. Baseball is yep. a failure. And I kind of view hunting as well as that, because I mean, nine times out of 10, Whenever you go in the woods, well, I'm not going to say nine times out of 10, but most of the time when you're going out in the woods, you might not see that target buck. You, mm -hmm. you might not see what you're chasing, mm -hmm. but from each time in this tree stand and also each time in the batter's box, you've learned something. Oh yeah. So, well, you know, I, I, I think you're right, but I also think you gotta have the mindset, right? Yes. Which, um, most people when they hunt, they don't have the mindset to harvest information. And when you sit in a, uh, whatever, if you're out in the woods and you're just out relaxing and killing time and just want to take in mother nature, so be it. You know, yeah. I, I, I've had days like that, but if you're trying to elevate your game, anytime you're going to spend the time to go into the woods and hunt, Harvest information if you're not going to harvest an animal. Watch where they're coming and going. Why are they why are they coming in from the side? Why are they exiting? You know, watch the deer behavior. What are they doing? What are they eating? Uh, you know, are they transitioning from one fall to the one one food plot to the next, or are they just predominantly dominating and just one? Why? Ask yourself why, why, why all the time. And when you do that, and you make uh, Case and I use the app called Notes in our phone. And you do that and you type that in your phone you, and you get home and you go through that and then you save it and you go through it at the end of the year, you'll be surprised at what you observed and what you learned that you already forgot. And then you sit through that and you read all those and you're like, my gosh, did I sure learn a lot this year? And you save it. And then you look back at your notes, you start making adjustments. Maybe you need to make a bottleneck food plot. Maybe you need to, you know, uh, trim some trees or, or cut some trees to lay down on your food plot edge. So it creates a more bottleneck because the, the one trail is not at, you know, 25 yards. Now it's at 45 yards, you know, make those notes. So that next, next summer and next spring, you can go in there and make those adjustments. So next fall, you're beating them at their game. And yeah. that's what we do. And, and we spend a lot of time doing that is, we do our best not to waste the sit. If we're sitting 
we're going to harvest information. We may not harvest an animal, but we're going to walk out of that woods that morning or that afternoon better than what we walked in on that particular spot. Like prime example, we got one spot we sat two or three times and actually Derek had his largest, my son Derek had his largest bow kill, potentially five or six minutes that we just couldn't get it done. And this deer was walking the food plot edge. Well, that food plot edge was like 45 yards and that's just a little bit too far. And so I'm, I, I made the note and then we re regrouped this spring it's like, Casey, we need to take that food plot edge where the warm season grass starts and the food plot edge and create that edge another 10 yards closer. Plant more warm season grasses, bring that warm, that, that food plot edge closer to us because deer love to, to, to walk edges. Now, when he walks that edge this fall, he's going to be at 35 instead of 45. The game's over. Yeah, it's, it's, you've already made that adjustment. Now that deer's going to be in within bow range and, it's going and he didn't, he, yeah, and he didn't know we, we did anything different, but he's going to do what he always does, which is walk an edge. So now if he does what deer did four, five, six, seven times last year, and they do it this year, which I assume they probably will, just depends if it's the right deer, we're going to have a chance to harvest them. So that's the type of stuff that I'm talking about. Yeah, that, that definitely makes a lot more sense because, I mean, I've – started observing more and trying to maximize my sits but this it's gotten bigger than what i anticipated it was you know i there was more into it than i anticipated and now i carry well i started about mid-season last year i started carrying like one of those little pocket notebooks with me oh and sure every deer that i saw i documented where where at where in the property where did it come what the wind was, what the uh, weather was, you know, what time. And then once I started, you know, kind of seeing a trend, I could adjust and maximize more of my sits. And that really helped. I mean, you bet. Absolutely. Because I noticed myself writing down more of the little things than more of the big things. And the little things right. way more than what a big question could have. Well, and I think if you if you write down the same thing several times, it's going to be become a pattern. And you're going to go, okay, this is a problem. I need to address this because it keeps coming up. Okay, so how am I going to fix that? And then you, you go fix it, and now that's no longer an issue going into next fall. You're not going to get them all right every single time. Absolutely. But you just constantly chip away at it. And before you know it, like some of our plots are, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old. And let me tell you, Every, I wouldn't say every year, but every two or three years, we're making adjustments because mother nature changed. Mother nature changed. The landscape is always changing. Uh, uh, maybe a deer trail wasn't there last year, but all of a sudden it showed up this year. Well, you're going to have to figure that out. Is that a good thing or that, is that a bad thing? If it's a bad thing, you're going to have to go down and cut some trees down, lay it over and force them out somewhere else so that you have a chance to harvest them. So Mother Nature's always making changes. You just got to stay on top of it and make changes and beat her. And that actually led me into the next question was like, how do you go about setting up your plots if you're starting out a, like a plot on a new piece of property? And like, how would well, you- we start? We, we start, the number one thing that we, we look at is access. Even though there are some plots, I'm like, okay, this would be absolutely- Perfect. I love it. Everything about it. But if I can't get to and from it without being detected, I'm not going to do it. Or if I can enhance it with warm season grasses and create some visual block or a ditch that I can get out of the set and get down and out of there quickly, we'll just, we just won't hunt it. We'll just, we won't go in there and pressure the deer because if you continue to pressure the deer, you become your worst enemy. So we look at the, the spots that we like. And then we talk backwards. Okay, can we get in and out of these spots relatively comfortably? And if the answer is yes, then we start a plan. If the answer is no, we move to another spot. And then we, we basically measure our food plots by the yard. And what I mean that is we physically take a range finder and we will measure and shoot across distances like certain, certain our plots, we have certain plots designated for, for, um, for gun. And those plots will not be no more than 150. We, we particularly like them between 
115 to 125 yards from any spot of the blind or tree, whatever we're doing, so that we know once he's inside of that, we know it's it's relatively should be a killable shot. Yes. You won't see us put a 200-yard food plot. We just won't do that. Um, and then we have the ones designed for bows that will measure, you know, yeah, if it's a transition, if we got two different types of food maybe it's brassicas and clover well that transition will have a measure to it maybe it's at 42 or 45 yards there'll be a reason why that transition is there or we might do a a half moon a half circle around the blind that's all brassicas inside of 35 yards and outside of that is all clover and you'll see a line well that line is just not by chance it's designed for a reason um, and that's because of, it could be topography. It could be the way the terrain is. It could be the way the deer exit and entry. Um, it could be because we want to put a scrape somewhere there in the scrapes. We're going to always put, if possibly, we're going to put them at between 18 and no more than 25 yards, um, from our setup. Um, and we'll always make sure they're depending on where they're coming and going will depend on what side of the setup we put them on. Um, so everything, if you, you know, maybe for your listeners, a great thing would, would be is for when you watch outdoor television, whether it's pursuit channel or outdoor television, uh, outdoor channel, um, or any show that you're watching, when you watch the television, watch the show or YouTube, whatever it may be, um, watch it with an education state of mind instead of an entertainment state of mind and if you do that you'll see these setups and you'll start picking them apart and go oh and freeze it and go okay what has he got here why is he doing this and if you really pay attention it'll probably tell you what they're doing if you can just slow down and really pay attention and you'll learn a lot from it um that's how i i've done a lot it's just if i watch a show i'm watching it for educational pur pur purposes and it's amazing what other people can can teach you if you just really stay focused in that state of mind i started doing that last night actually after uh you told me about you know slowing it down and watching and actually one of the videos that i watched was a property pretty much identical to a property i hunt and okay it was something that i've overlooked forever i've overlook this spot of this property it was it's in a hardwoods and there's just a big open with um uh, one uh, tree that always drops acorns pretty much every single year and for some reason i've overlooked that that one spot and just never hunted that one spot because it's so close to bedding but yeah. then i got on my onyx maps and everything and started looking at the fastest access in and access out and it's one of the easiest and most accessible spots on that property yeah. and i'm like there you go yeah i was talking to my uh my friend at work that hunts with me he hunts with hts and we was talking about it and we was like man we gotta hang a stand there this year because like it's we couldn't believe that we've overlooked that spot for you know three years now <laughs> <laughs> well like, it's working you're getting you know, better we're like, we're like why would we overlook that that's like one of those spots that you see and you're like hunt it you know and we every time we walk through it we're like we need to hang a stand we've just never done it and well you know most people never act on their actions that's that's anything regardless of life flow and hunting or personal life or whatever you want to do is you've got to act and if your gut tells you and your education and your homework tells you you know go set it up sit it and if and if all the deer are coming down wind of you and you're getting blown and it's just making your skin crawl climb down and get out and don't don't go back in but you you'll you'll know on the first set you know you you want you want to push it hard enough so you're pushing the edge you know i think a good rule of thumb is you know call it 75 to 85 percent of the deer should be in front of you and and if you're pushing the edge you know 15 to 25 percent of deer are going to catch downwind of you You're, there's no such thing as a bulletproof set it, it never will be absolutely but you but you, but if you if you're so cautious you're never going to hunt anything you're never going to harvest anything 
So you got to find that fine line where you're getting well over the majority of them, but you know, you're still going to move some of them, but then, you know, depending on the setup, make sure you're hunting the thermals. If you're going into the woods, make sure you're, you're hunting on the morning because the thermals are going to rise. So your, your scent is going to go up instead of down. Once that clock turns, you know, two, three in the afternoon and that sun starts to drop, those thermals are going to start to fall. When those thermals start to fall, then you know what? You better be pretty confident in your set or you need to get out. Yes. You know, it, it just all, but I don't know if it's on a, a cliff or, you know, there's 8 million questions that could cause a guy to sit there all day too, you know? Exactly. Um, so just got to think through it, you know, but most guys, most people are, are two ways, either super aggressive and they are their worst enemy or they're too cautious and they're never in the game to begin with. And there's that fine line you got to try to float with. And the only way to do that is just years of, of practice. And unfortunately, it's years of failures. Yeah, it's trial and error. I mean, it is. Unfortunately, it is. But every, every error that you have, you can always learn from. That's the best. 100%. Part. Yep. Yep. That's right. That's um, right. Let's move on to the next question here. Or did you have anything else to say about that? Go ahead. Um, so like deer movement during different times of the season, like places that you would hunt early season, uh, you know, towards rut, then uh, late season, like what's your ideal set? Sure. Uh, early season, you know, if, if, if you have, uh, you know, beans that are still green, by far those things are just deadly, borderline unfair. Now, you're, you're going to have to, you know, pattern those deer and make sure you've got the exit and entry figured out. And then, you know, like, you know, Missouri, September 15th, I was uh, October 1st, everybody's pretty much somewhere between those dates. And, you know, those, depending on when those beans are planted will dictate when they, you know, shift over to Brown, but usually you have a few days um, to hunt those or, the other one is clover fields are my two favorite uh, spots for early se season. But if I had to pick one, it would probably probably be beans. If I had to pick one, if they're green. Um, um, and then uh, mid season, you know, de depending on the activities, we, I, I sure like, you know, when it's that 22nd, 23rd, 24th of October through called the 15th, 16th of November, we hunt a lot with decoys um, because they, it just uh, the track record that has shown me over the years that, you know, we're, we're chasing, you know, five and a half, if not six and a half uh, years of age. And those guys traditionally just can't handle a decoy. And um, I sure enjoy hunting, you know, parts of the farm that they can be seen from a long ways away. And once they see them, they just reel them in. Now, obviously you gotta have the right conditions and the right setup and all those types of things that go with it. But that is one of the tactics that I think are truly undervalued and overlooked. That's one thing um, I've always overlooked myself and I've been seeing a lot more videos of it on like YouTube and everything. So mm -hmm. that's something I've wanted to try this year you know just they're, it's a pain it's a pain to carry it's a pain to put in the truck they're loud they're bulky they're so just cumbersome <laughs> um but let me tell you they're worth their weight in gold if you're willing to carry them in they are um you know for for those listeners who don't know how to do it make sure you i, I prefer to put it between 18 and 22 yards away from your setup and make sure you put the decor quartering to you meaning the head is quartering to you so that when the deer approaches it, it's going to approach more often than not, it's going to approach it to its head, which then will put the deer quartering away to you. Um, or sometimes it'll be at least broadside. But there are times that the buck will come um, to the quartering and stick them in the bud or whatever. That's not that common. Will it happen? Yes. I just had it, had it happen to me last year. Um, but more often than not, they will square them up nose to nose or close to nose to nose. That's why you want to put that decor quartering to you. And the reason why I put it between 18 and 22 yards 
is sometimes, especially on, on mature bucks, they will hang out about any, anywhere from 10 to 20 yards away from that buck, just trying to catch his wind and get downwind of him and kind of just walk back and forth, checking him out. Well, if he, if you set the decoy up at 30 or 35 and he hangs out, but you know, 45 or 55, he's got, you've got no chance of shooting him. Yeah. So if you put him at, you know, plus or minus 20 yards and he hangs up at 30, you still got a great chance of shooting him. So yeah, a doable th shot. Th that's right. So that's why I try to put it at 18 to 22 yards, depending on the terrain of the field and the angle that I think they're going to come from and how I want them to see them will dictate that distance. Um, and then it gives you enough distance between the decoy and your setup that if they want to come between you and the decoy, they don't feel crowded and they'll make that, that turn if they want to come between you and the decoy and they, and they won't feel so, so closed in. Um, some guys like putting the decoy out farther. Um, I don't, um, I, because I've seen too many times where the, the bucks hang up at that 30, 35, 40 yards. And if he's at, you know, 20 yards, he's at 40. Well, he's still got a chance to release the arrow. So, Absolutely. um, those are, that's one of my favorite, if not my favorite tactic at that time of year. And then late season, you know, once it gets, we do a lot of, late December and January hunting. And if, if you have corn or beans, you know, late season with snow and cold temperatures, it's just a matter of time before the deer are going to get there. You just got to have, you know, good Intel with your reconnaissance cameras and pay attention. And once they move in, you know, and they find it, they're going to be there for, you know, at least a few days, unless you run out of food. Well, Casey, Casey and I, I shot my largest Wisconsin buck this past winter it's like January 25th or 26th. Um, and that was over being filled. We had, oh, got it. Must have been 18, 20 inches of snow. Um, and he started routinely coming to the bean field. And it was, you know, it was magic. Um, and once they find it, you know, they're slaves to their stomachs. So in case he had the same luck two or three days after I did um, wow. on a great mature buck. So definitely get um, together there. No. So come late season, if you've got beans or corn um, and you got cold temps, it's a matter of time before they're going to get there. Yeah. Cause doesn't that corn usually hold pretty well warm? Uh, what, 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 I'm not so sure I understand your question. Like I've always, I've heard from like people in my family when I was growing up hunting that like late season that, the reason a lot of deer go to corn, I don't know if it's true or not. It's just always been that theory that I've heard, but um, like the reason they go whenever it's snow and why they hit those cornfields so hard is that corn kind of helps hold in warmth. Not well, it's carbohydrates. I mean, they're, they're struggling for food and it's, it's, they are slaves to their stomach um, that time of year. And so if you have beans or corn, they're going to come to it because of carbohydrates and, and they want to, to fill up. So, um, you know, you will see any, all throughout the year, deer really don't, they browse and yes, they browse in the wintertime. Yes. I'm not going to have that argument with anybody, but they seem to spend more time in the late season on beans or corn staying longer eating because food is so sparse and, long as you have that food source that time of year and your neighbors don't you're going to attract who knows how many more white tails to your part of your farm than you have during the normal season okay yeah that does make a lot that does make a lot of sense but the downside of that is you got to be prepared for it and make sure you have enough tonnage because once you start once they find it it don't take long for it to disappear so you know, to have a three, four, five acre, you know, six acre plot that's beans or corn. And if your neighbors don't have any food, you're going to double, triple, quadruple your herd in a matter of days, if not weeks, once the snow hits and the cold temps come. Yeah. So the deer are going to be coming from everywhere <laughs> at that point. Yeah. Now, you know, we hunt states that, that um, we can't bait. So I, I don't, I can't comment on states that can bait. I know you're in Ohio and I know Ohio can bait. So, yes. you know, guys are running baits, you know, um, through that and they attract them that way. It's the same, 
it's, you know, legal there. Uh, so I, I don't have much experience in those type of states because I've never, you know, managed herds in those states. Um, but if you're in a non-baiting state, those beans and cornfields are magic come late season. But so I got uh, one more question really here that, uh, well, I got two more questions actually. So the one question I think everybody loves to hear about is what helped you, what helped lead to your success in your hunt for your 233 inch deer? You know, that's it led to my success. Cause I'm mean, um, kind of a wide range there, but I'm, everybody I'm sure wants to hear about that because I mean, that's, that's a once in a lifetime deer. I mean, some people, don't. I, I would, sure. I would have to say patience. Um, obviously you got to have the, you know, the, the, well, there's, there's several factors because there's a lot of work that went into it that when he got to be that big, he didn't want to go anywhere else. And that was because we had timber stand improvements. We had warm season grasses, we had water, we had cover, we had food. We gave that deer no reason to leave. And so if you have that scenario, which takes a lot of, you know, foresight and work before the deer even shows up or calls your farm home. And once he finds it, he doesn't want to leave. So I guess that's factor one. Factor two was once we found him and we got him patterned to have the patience to not go in for, I think we killed him on the 29th of October. So call it 29 days after opening day, because it opens on October 1st, to wait until the weather and the pressure and the wind and all that was in our favor was the hardest thing. I would say. <laughs> because, you know, every single time we had a northwest wind, I'm like, okay, we could go, but it's really warm. You know, I don't want to walk in there, lay my scent down and educate him. If I'm going to go in there, I want to try to have the, the, the highest probability of tipping them over. And so we did wait. And, it, and when we did, you know, it's hard to believe, but we killed them on, a, on our very first sit. Wow. That is and, and that's because of patience. Did you have um, asked that deer before in the past? Um, well, to go back on that deer, uh, we killed him on, in 2000. 2018 in 2017 i was chasing a deer called major league that, that we tipped over in 17 paul 17 that went 203 and the reason why i tell you that story is because we found i was so focused on that deer that extra innings i didn't even pay attention to him now we found his sheds the spring of 18 and he went mid mid 180s he wouldn't have went 90s but he was in the mid 80s and we didn't realize he was that big until we found his sheds and then he blew up obviously that following year to what he was. Wow. So, um, it was one of those things that once we figured out where he was living, we spent a lot of time observing him from the far and let it, and we gave him a space. We only penetrated, uh, the farm on the day we harvested him and everything else with either, either done with reconnex cameras or, uh, we sat a ridge and washed him from afar with a spotting scope and trying to figure out what he was doing. You definitely have insane patience because <laughs> that would have been well. And I think, and I think when you, when you look at anybody who is harvesting, you know, I bring up Marcher, I bring up Lee Lukoski, any, anybody who is tipping over mature deer and I'm say of age and of size, you will find one thing that's in, that's common within all of them, which is um, persistence, the never give up attitude, and patience, knowing when to push the gas and when to push the brake, and going, okay, we need, we need, we're not going in here, we can't, it's not right, um, we're not going to lay our scent down, and because every time you go in there and you don't harvest something, you are educating them. That's fact. And so every time you walk out of the woods and you don't harvest something, you're giving them one more ace in their deck that they're going to potentially beat you the next time you come in. So, you know, the old saying is observe more, hunt less and kill more. That is absolutely true. 
And most guys want to hunt a lot, but I'm guessing they probably kill less. And that's okay. If you like being in the woods and seeing Mother Nature and seeing the deer move around, great. But if you're out there to harvest animals and take your game to the next level, um, hunting less is going to do yourselves a tons of favor because you're increasing your opportunity to harvest more because you're not laying down the scent and educating the herd. And I think that's one of the big things because like I hunt a lot of public land also. I have some farms, but I also hunt a lot of public land. And that's one of the hard things is because you, I mean, there's no control on who walks in them woods. Yeah, of course. So of I, course. I just like the challenge of it because it's, you never, sure. yeah. And I mean, you know, whenever I go in there and like at one buck that I have on our channel that um, me and one of our guys, Wyatt filmed, we was, uh, we was coming across, we scouting for the day and we came across the CRP field on this public land and we saw a couple of does and they ended up seeing us and they kind of moved off a little bit. Well, next thing you know, on the edge of the CRP field, there's just, just big tall grass. And all of a sudden he taps me on the shoulder and he's like, Hey, get down. And we're like in the middle of this field and uh, we're laying in this field with the tripod up with the camera zoomed in on this deer and he pops up. And I mean, he was probably a mid, well, he's probably about a 140 inch deer and that was a pretty good buck that we've seen on public land so you know it was probably three three and a half on so we was definitely excited to see that deer then uh we ended up seeing him three times more during the season when we was coming out of our sits so it was it was pretty cool and we're hoping to see him again this year which he has one very distinctive thing about him. He looks like he has like a bob tail. I'll be dang. Yeah, it's it's a pretty cool video. I'll have to send you a picture of him after we get off. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'd love to see it. But uh, so I do have uh, another question for you also. How do you go about pattering pattering up? How do you go about pattering deer? Oh, there's no question. We use Reconish cameras. I mean, there we we try to minimize our pressure and laying scent down on our farms, and that's you know our number one tactic. There's not even a close. The close second would be observing them with you know our loopholes from either whether it be binoculars or spotting codes from a from a ridge or from a road. But we will start our trail cameras come mid July. Um, late july usually around the 15th to the 20th and let them run and we don't check them for at least at least six to eight weeks um let them soak and start our season from there once we get our first round then we'll look at those and then if we need to you know target at one particular animal then we'll you know flank it with more cameras and try to understand his his patterns and and then work back from that but um, we let our reconnaissance cameras do 95, 98% of our scouting for us because it keeps the pressure off our farms. Yeah, that's, I always thought kind of patterning like animals came down to watching trails and walking trails and understanding the way they travel. Then after me and you got off the phone the other night, I started to rethink that as in running more trail cameras to understand which way these deer travel instead of trying to watch them and track them on foot, you know, being property. Yeah. I mean, if it, you know, the, the best time to truly understand deer trails and rubs and scrapes and all that is, you know, February, February and March and early April when the season's over. And if you go push deer around, it's not a big deal. Um, and the, your farm is truly a chalkboard at that point. You can go out and you can find all the scrapes and all the trails and the rub lines that you thought may or may not be there or find a new set of rub lines. And when, when we do that, we'll actually drop a pin on our hunt on X maps and we'll make a note. And we'll, when we find those new spots like that, and then we'll look at what we're doing in that area now do we need to make adjustments or is a new potential spot that we overlooked and learning your farm in my opinion is the best time in that late february march timeline 
the farm will tell you what you need to do if you go lace your boots up and put all the miles on. It's the best thing, I'm telling you. I definitely. And it's fun. And yeah. it's fun. Yeah, you, it's always fun getting the boots on the ground and walking these same paths and understanding a property a little bit more each time you walk it. That's one yeah. of the parts about this. A hundred percent. And you learn every time you do it. Absolutely. But that was all the questions that I had. Uh, I don't know if you have anything else you want to say or anything. No, uh, you know, we're, I'm an open book and I'm, I'm happy to share with anybody. And, you know, if somebody wants to DM me, uh, the best way to do that would be, you know, uh, Greg underscore Glessinger, which is G L E S I N G E R underscore jury outdoors on Instagram, um, would be the best way to send me any questions or thoughts and I'll do my best to answer them. And I'll typically after pod po podcasts, I get quite a few of them. So if that happens, I'll get to them. Just give me some time, but um, I'll be happy to uh, help anybody I can if possible. And I'll also have all of his stuff linked uh, in the description below. So all you have to do is go down to the description and it'll take you straight to his Instagram and you can DM him from there if you have any questions and everything. And I really appreciate you coming onto this podcast with us and especially on such a short notice. And, uh, Hey, no problem. I'm glad to do it. It was Absolutely. definitely a great experience, and I have learned a ton. <laughs> and I'll be listening to this podcast probably three or four more times this season. So, I definitely. Well, we all we all start we so we all start at the bottom, and the only way to move your game forward is truly like podcasts or reading or watching YouTube. Um, and just because you see somebody doing something doesn't doesn't mean it's going to fit in your tactic or work in your farm. But at least you can eliminate it or potentially pull it into your your potential items to try. And the more you do those things, the more you're going to, you know, go, man, that 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 I can make happen that that I really like. And the more exposure you have, the better off you're going to be. Yes. And, you know, never stop learning because when you do that, then you just can't, you can't move your game forward. Exactly. And I have, I've definitely tried to pick you apart as best as I can. And uh, I've asked you a lot of questions and you've gave me some really good answers. So I appreciate all the help that you gave me. And I hope we get to talk more this season. And um, I hope that you'll join us for another podcast sometime here in the future. Yeah, for sure. I'd love to love to help you guys out. You bet. Well, I really appreciate it, and uh, thank you guys for all watching. Remember, all of Greg's stuff will be in the description below. And uh, if you guys have any other questions, you guys can DM me on Instagram at uh, Hitting the Sticks. So I really appreciate it. Thank you again, Greg. It's been a great time. You bet, man. We'll talk soon. Take care. Take care.